Good evening to you. It's good to see you out for this Ash Wednesday service. I want to give you just a little bit of information as we begin. First of all, why do we have Ash Wednesday? Well, it has both a religious and a cultural significance. Now, how many of you in here have heard of Mardi Gras? Who has not heard of Mardi Gras? Okay. In the days of our ancestors, you took the time before Lent began to clean out the lorries. The fat would go rancid if it was left too long. And so in that time, you fried up everything you could, and thus that was the beginning of that celebration. But all that ended on Ash Wednesday when we turned to the religious side of this, and everyone was giving up fat during the 40 days of Lent in those ancient times. Now today you can give up any number of things for our culture is so much more advanced, but the basics are still the same. It's a time when we turn our attention to God and we have some type of fast. As we move forward, we'll have responsive readings. This is the closest to normalcy we have had in a couple of years. Uh, the one deviation we will have during the imposition of the ashes, uh, Kevin and I will be wearing a mask because you will be in close contact to us when you come forward. Other than that, it's pretty close to what normal was back two years ago or before. When we call the worship, I'll read the fine print and you'll respond with a bold face print. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Bless the Lord who forgives our sin. God's mercy endures May we pray together. Gracious God, you are the maker of everything and judge of all that you have made. From the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death we will rise up to it. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sin and live lives worthy of your calling through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And if you'll take your hymnals and turn to number 269 and then stand and sing. Lord, throughout these 40 days.
Our responsive reading is number 758, excuse me, 785 in the back of your hymnal. Again, I will read the normal print and you will read the italics, bold print, excuse me. I'll give you time to turn back there. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your God, have mercy, while I am transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity, and I have been sinful since my mother Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. I have for my sins and my all my Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifices. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. You may be seated.
Our scripture reading is from Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 21. Hear the word of the Lord. Be, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners, so they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their face so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor, moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our thanks be to God. Bob was sitting at the traffic light, waiting for it to turn green. Sure enough, it turned green. He proceeded into the intersection, and then from his left came a car running a red light, smashed right into the side of the car. He had to be removed physically from the car. The ambulance arrived. The ambulance EMTs came and gave first aid to him. And they said, Bob, we need to take you on to the hospital, get checked out. Bob stood up, he was sore. He said, no, I'm, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me. They said, you've just been in a terrible automobile accident. Please, at least let us take you to the hospital to get checked out. He said, I tell you, there's nothing wrong with me. They said, you don't know. You could have internal injuries. You don't know. Please, let's go. Finally, he said, I told you there's nothing wrong with me. By that time, his wife had arrived. He got in the car with his wife. He went home. Three hours later, he died of internal injuries. To say there's nothing wrong with me, it's a dangerous thing to say. When you're talking about spirituality, it's an incredibly dangerous thing to say. There's nothing wrong with me. That's unacceptable. That's anti-Christian. That's unacceptable to God. An authentic Christian is someone who stands before God and says, there is something wrong with me. A Christian is also someone who says, but Jesus Christ has overcome my sin and has taken away the things that are wrong with me. As Al said, today is Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent. What's it all about? Al gave us a little bit of a description, but, but maybe I can describe it as I focus on a story that Jesus told in Scripture. You probably know the story. It's about two opposite people. One who said, there's nothing wrong with me, and another who said, there's everything wrong with me. One of them represents what Lent isn't. 
One of them represents what Lent is. Let's look at the two people. Jesus told this story, by the way, to people who were confident in their own righteousness. People who actually looked down on other people. Jesus told the story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. A Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, remember the Pharisees. You know, sometimes we who have been in the church a long time, we hear the word Pharisee. We want to say boo because we figure they're going to be the bad guy in this story. But remember, Pharisees were not the bad guy. Pharisees were the good guys. Pharisees were the religious people. Pharisees were the people who lived good, clean, holy, righteous lives. The tax collector, on the other hand, was a person who swindled, who intimidated others, who cheated and lied and took money from people. Both of them came to church. Both of them went to the sanctuary to pray. The Pharisee stood up and said about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not a robber. I'm not an evildoer. I'm not an adulterer. Thank God I'm not like this tax collector. You know me, God. I fast twice a week. I give a tithe of all that I earn, even more than what I earn. Any extra income, I, I tithe that to God. Maybe you can sum up his prayer like this. I thank you, God, that there's really nothing wrong with me. I do everything right. And maybe he was right. He was a good citizen. He obeyed the law, the religious law and the civil law. He lived a moral life. He lived an upright life. He did all the religious things that you could possibly do. He gave his tithe to the church. He fasted twice a week. Really, there wasn't much wrong with him that anybody could see. But the other guy, he was the opposite of the Pharisee. He had been stealing money his whole life. He had been ruining the lives of others so that he could live it up. He knew that his whole life had been a disaster. He knew that he deserved to go to hell when he died. And Jesus said that tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even walk up to the altar. He wouldn't even walk up to the front of the temple. He wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven. He just kind of shuffled his feet. And he looked down. He was so ashamed of himself and his sin. He beat his breast. And all he could say was, God have mercy on me. For I am a sinner. His prayer was the opposite of the Pharisees. Maybe you could sum it up this way. God, there's everything in the world wrong with me. Help me. And Jesus goes on to say. Surprisingly, that the tax collector was the one that was forgiven by God, not the perfect Pharisee. Why? Jesus tells us. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee was proud of all the good things he was doing. He was a leader in the community. He was a leader in the church. He looked down on others. The tax collector was humble, sorry for his sins, and they were many. So what is Jesus saying here? Is Jesus saying that you can earn the forgiveness of sins by being humble? Look at how humble that tax collector is, says God. That tax collector deserves to be forgiven because he's so humble. Is that how it works? That's what a lot of people think. But that's not how it works. Humility can be a tricky thing. The story's told of, of the senior pastor of the large church who came into the sanctuary. One morning he knelt at the altar and he was praying. A few minutes later the associate pastor looked and saw him, him kneeling there. So the associate pastor joined him. As it turned out, there was a street dude who was out. He was just looking for a handout and he happened to look in. And so he saw the two preachers there. So he thought he'd join them and, and he knelt down at the altar too. Senior pastor began to pray out loud. He said, oh Lord, 
Forgive my sins. Be merciful to me, for I am the worst of sinners. The associate pastor took up the cry, O Lord, forgive my sins, for I am chief among sinners. The street dude chimed in, O Lord, I am nothing but mere dust in thy presence. One pastor elbowed the other pastor and pointing to the street dude said, Dr. John, look who thinks he's nothing. Humility does not save you. And that's why God forgives you then your salvation would be completely dependent on you and your level of humility. Then you could never be sure if you were forgiven by God or not because you would never know if you've been humble enough. True, authentic in your humility, authentic enough for God to forgive you. See, the truth of the matter is neither the Pharisee nor the tax collector deserve to be forgiven. The Pharisee didn't because he was conceited and self-righteous, thought he was better than everybody else, thought he was perfect. The tax collector didn't deserve God's forgiveness because of the terrible life he was leading. Neither one deserved to be forgiven by God. See, God forgives us out of his mercy as a result of his undeserved love. God forgives people. God forgives people because Jesus has taken away the sins of the world because of that sacrifice Jesus made of the cross, cleansing the world of all its sin. He offers forgiveness to all of us. In this story, God offered forgiveness to both the Pharisee and the tax collector, but only the tax collector received God's forgiveness. Why? Because in his mercy, he authentically asked to be forgiven. So God won't forgive you if you don't ask to be forgiven. And if you think there's nothing wrong with you, you won't ask to be forgiven. Those who stand before God and say, there's everything wrong with me, Lord have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. Those people who recognize their sin, recognize their need for God's help and ask. Those are the people that God receives with his forgiveness. Not because they earned it by, by groveling, but because God shows undeserved love to all who simply ask. You see, the humble tax collector is the picture of Lent. The proud Pharisee is the opposite of Lent. Which one are you tonight? How will you observe Lent this year? Do you plan to act extra religious? Many people observe Lent that way. Maybe I'll give up something for Lent. I'll no longer watch my favorite TV show. I'll give up alcohol. I won't eat chocolate. I'll no longer listen to my favorite CD. I'll, I'll get off the, the, the Facebook. Look how religious I am. God must be extra happy with me. Because I did it all Lent. I didn't cheat once. Well, maybe once. But I didn't cheat very often. It's Lent a time for self-denial. This evening, Jesus speaks to us through his word. And he tells us that Lent is a time of self-denial, a time to give up something. But Jesus isn't concerned with chocolate and, and, and CDs and, and Facebook. He's concerned with what's going on in your heart. Lent is a time to give up sins. It's a time to give up the sin of hypocrisy. Acting like a Christian on the outside, but being proud and self-centered on the inside. Then is the time to give up the sin of duplicity. Being a Christian on Sunday, but being an unbeliever Monday through Friday. It's a time to give up the sin of, of being apathetic. Someday, I'll get my life together spiritually. Right now, though, I'm having too much fun. What is Lent? Lent is the man who stood in the back of the temple and looked down at the ground and said, Lord, have mercy on me. It's a time for us to be like that man, to give up our sinful habits, our sinful attitudes, to stand before God and ask him to forgive us. And before I stop talking, one more very, very, very important thing. Hear this. After we lay our sins before Christ, Lent is also a time to give up our guilty feelings. Just as the tax collector walked home justified before God, so can we walk away knowing that we have been forgiven. I no longer have to feel guilty about my sin. I no longer have to beat myself up about the way I had lived. I've been forgiven. 
My sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not because of anything I did, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the mercy and the grace of God. I can start over. I can work hard to be someone who obeys God, who worships God every day with the way I live my life. See, Lent is an attitude. An attitude of honesty and humility as we confess our sins to God, but also an attitude of relief and joy. Knowing that our sins have been forgiven, that our God has wiped away our slate clean so that we can serve God with our whole lives with joy and strength. These next seven weeks are a time for you to look deep within your heart, to think about your life and how you've been living it. What sins are you going to give up for Lent and for the rest of your life? Jesus will forgive that sin. Wash that sin away at the cross. Promise to empower you to live that new life that glorifies him. If people want to temporarily give up something for Lent as a sign of love for their Savior, wonderful. But what Christ is really concerned about is what's in your heart tonight. My friends, tonight we begin a rather long walk to the cross where we'll see just how serious and terrible our sins are. But there we also see how wonderful and deep our Savior's love is for us. <laughs> and even better news, the road doesn't end there but keeps going all the way to the empty tomb where Jesus rises from the dead to prove that all of our sins have been forgiven. May God bless each and every one of you as we begin our Lenten journey together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there would be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith, were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance. And as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now come forward and receive the mark of a follower of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I invite all those who desire, and of course this is just if you desire, to come forward and receive the imposition of the ashes. If you'll come up the outside aisle and then you come back to your seats through the, through the center aisle. As Al said, we'll both be wearing these uh, special masks here. And uh, so to, um, this is just an extra sign of, of uh, protection. Uh, but I invite all who will to come forward and receive this mark of repentance.
Let's pray once again. Now may the almighty and merciful God who desires not the death of the sinner, but that we turn from the wickedness and live, accept your repentance, forgive your sins, and restore you by the Holy Spirit to newness of life. Amen. Let us sing one last time. 467, trust and obey. Let's stand together as we sing. 467. and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you all these 40 days of Lent, all through Easter, and all the days of your life. Go in the precious name of Christ and be blessed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the joy of Christ.